Is your boss starting to seem irritatingly demanding? Is your work at the office starting to feel too repetitive? Is your workday starting to feel increasingly endless? If so, you're not alone. According to the Australian Bureau of Statistics, one in three working adults suffers from moderate to extreme work-related stress. Workers' compensation claims have increased dramatically, costing companies billions in lost productivity for replacement workers. However, there's hope in sight. Job burnout doesn't have to destroy your life. It has stood the test of time. God's book, the Bible, still relevant in today's complex world. It is written, sharing hope around the globe. Alistair knew that his job as manager of a thriving company was quite demanding. He knew that he was a very driven individual and he knew that he rarely got enough rest. But he seemed to like it that way. He loved his job. And there was always one more program to promote, one more conflict among staff members to resolve or one more sales goal to meet. There was always something unexplainable pushing him to stay ahead of the pack. In fact, Alistair was so blindly committed to his career that he wore his chest pains, his sleepless nights and jam-packed schedule like merit badges. He was almost proud of them. But finally, one day shooting pains in his chest forced him to visit the doctor. After an examination, the physician asked, have you been under a lot of pressure lately? The manager answered a little sarcastically, pressure? Is there life without it? But then the doctor made a shocking prescription. I don't know what you do, but I recommend you start looking for another job. That woke Alistair up in a hurry. He might have to quit the company. Something was indeed wrong. He realized he was 29 years old and right on the edge of a heart attack. For many people, it's not easy to stop on the road to job burnout. Sometimes it takes a shocking announcement at the doctor's office. Sometimes we don't stop until the damage has already been done. And that's why it's so important for us to understand just what causes job burnout and how to prevent it. That's what we're going to be talking about in our program today. We can define job burnout as a debilitating psychological condition brought about by unrelieved work stress. What happens in burnout? Well, generally something like this. Your energy reserves are depleted. Your resistance to illness is lowered. You feel increased dissatisfaction and pessimism. You become more inefficient at work. Unrelieved work stress simply wears you out physically and emotionally, and you begin to feel dead. What are the most common causes of this unrelieved stress? The most frequently mentioned is the problem of dead-end jobs. It's very stressful to feel that you're trapped. You're stuck in a dead-end job in which there's no hope of advancement, no hope for increased earnings, no hope for going anywhere. Then there's the familiar problem of deadlines. These become destructively stressful when they come one right after another, when there's always one more appointment, one more demand, one more schedule. When you always seem to be rushing about, catching up, burnout can't be far away. Then there are deadbeat co-workers who might be another cause of burnout. When you find yourself doing almost all the work because the people around you are lazy or lethargic, the stress starts building up. Finally, we have the negative job pressure created by deadlocks. Two forces in constant opposition and conflict. Usually that means you and your boss. Dead ends, deadlines, deadbeats, deadlocks. It's important to note the causes of burnout. And remember that many of these stresses can also happen to spouses working at home, especially to women who must work and take care of a family. The pressures on them can be enormous. But now let's move from the causes of burnout to prevention. What can we do to reverse the cycle in a difficult situation? 
Somehow we've got to let the steam out when that negative job pressure starts to build. Here are seven control techniques for preventing burnout. First, start your day slowly. There's something we can learn from an ancient biblical concept. Most of us measure our day from the time we wake up in the morning. Interestingly enough, the biblical perspective is just the opposite. For Bible writers, the day began in the evening when they went to sleep. The Bible says that the evening and the morning are the first day. The evening and the morning are the second day. It would be good for each of us to start our day in the evening too. Get to bed early. Then get up early enough to enjoy a wholesome, leisurely breakfast, read the Bible, have a little devotional time, pray, talk to the kids. You know, when I'm facing a tough day, I find that praying and meditating on a passage of Scripture gets me going in a much better frame of mind. For many people, job burnouts begin as they're rushing out of the door with the car keys in one hand and a cup of coffee in the other. Starting the day slowly after a good night's rest is one way you can relieve the pressure of your job. Secondly, to prevent burnout, learn how to deal with your boss. You may be deadlocked with a slave driver or a silent boss or a critic and have to deal with different situations in different ways. But there's one strategy that breaks deadlocks of all kinds quite effectively, and that's simply to open the channels of communication. Talk directly to your boss about the problem. Our first instinct when we find ourselves in a deadlock is to marshal support, to complain to our friends about how terrible so-and-so is. We allow the conflict or the hurt feeling to smolder, to fester inside us. Jesus once taught a principle about relationships, which I believe can be a valuable help in the workplace. It's in Matthew chapter 18 and verse 15. The words of Jesus are some of the most effective words ever penned on how to achieve positive interpersonal relationships. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. There it is. We might paraphrase the verse this way. If your boss sins against you, go and tell him about it between you and him alone. Deal with the problem directly. Don't just talk behind his back. You'd be surprised how many deadlocks can be resolved with just a little open communication. Well, um, I'm going to have to let you go. Andy was the public relations director for a large yeah, Christian ministry. He liked so. his work, right, well, but he began to feel that the manager, his boss, was always putting pressure on him. The man kept hinting that Andy wasn't showing enough initiative. He wasn't getting any new projects going. Andy thought he was trying hard and shared more and more of his frustrations with his assistant, Jerry. Jerry could tell that the pressure was really building up inside of Andy really taking a physical toll on his colleague. He noticed the pale complexion, the twitch and shakiness in his hands, the tension in his voice, the twitch in his eyes. Andy was well on his way to burnout. So one day the two decided to show some initiative. They had a supply of attractive scripture promise cards lying around and sent them to all the departments, asking the secretaries to include a card in each letter that they sent out. That little gesture should certainly generate some goodwill. It was certainly creative. Well, wouldn't you believe it? The manager rejected their suggestion. No cards were mailed out. Now Andy and Jerry really felt frustrated. Here they tried to show some initiative and the boss squelched their plan. More twitching in the hands, more tension in the voices. Andy especially felt more and more frustrated, angry and more and more alienated than ever. But Jerry decided to do something they hadn't tried before. Go to the boss based on Matthew chapter 18 and talk directly about the problem. He asked the manager what he had against those nice scripture promise cards going out. The answer was very simple. A lot of the ministry correspondence involved financial and legal affairs. And it wasn't quite appropriate to send out scripture promises with those bills and invoices. 
But if they could just send the cards out with other ministry correspondents, there'd be no problem. That would be fine. Jerry was quite surprised. A little bit of communication cleared everything up. The boss wasn't quite the monster face to face as he had seemed while he and Andy were huddled in their office talking about him. In fact, Jerry kept an open line of communication with his boss and found that he could enjoy a pleasant relationship with him. Go to your brother, go to your boss. Tell him about the problem courteously but firmly, just between the two of you. That small act would cut through an enormous amount of deadlock and tension and pressure in the workplace. Okay, here's the third strategy for preventing job burnout. Cut back on your excessive hours. Now, that should be an obvious solution. But the fact is 30% of Australians work more than 50 hours a week. More and more people are grinding out longer hours. However, we can't get around the simple reality that the more hours you work, the more likely you are to burn out. Now, it may seem that your work is never quite done, that you always have something to do to catch up or to get ahead, but we need to realise that certain kinds of work are vastly more important than others. Listen to this gem from writer Christopher Morley. If we discovered that we had only five minutes left to say all we wanted to say, every telephone booth would be occupied by people calling other people to stammer that they loved them. Doesn't that still ring true today? What would you do if you knew that you had five minutes left to live? Rush to the office and finish up that report? I don't think so. You'd do a different kind of work. You'd work on relationships. You'd spend time with the ones you love. Please remember that burnout doesn't just affect your job performance. It affects those closest to you. So please, for the sake of your own well-being and the happiness of your family, cut down on those excessive hours. Now we're ready for strategy number four. You can help prevent burnout by changing gears after work. This principle is known as stress substitution. You relieve one type of stress by substituting a different kind of activity. The aim is balance. If you have a desk job, for example, that demands a lot of mental concentration, change gears after work and play tennis or go jogging or play golf. If your job is a physical one, then try relaxing with a good book after work. Stretch those mind muscles that haven't been stretched all day. You get the picture? Part of what we do when we change gears after work is to break the tyranny of time. Our bodies and minds have been in a certain rhythm on the job, usually one defined by deadlines and the clock. After work, it's important to break out of that rhythm. Dr. Larry Dossey, the author of Space, Time and Medicine, has two antique clocks in his office. One always runs fast, the other always runs slow. They remind me, Dossey says, that my life is not ruled by clocks, that I can choose the time I live by. How do we slow time down if our workday has been a hectic rush? Focus completely on some pleasant activity, say working in the garden or listening to beautiful music. If you really get into it, enjoying each moment, time almost ceases to exist. You start living by your own inner rhythms. You catch up with the part of you that got lost in the busyness of the job. Changing gears after work helps to break the cycle that leads to burnout. The next strategy is to practice relaxing. Sometimes you need to do this in the middle of a hectic work day. How? Just stop, close your eyes and take deep, slow breaths. Try to clear your mind of everything but one pleasant thought. As for me, I love to meditate on Jesus' love for me. This kind of mental timeout is important in breaking the build-up of pressure and stress. The problem is, the more pressure you feel, the more likely you are to keep rushing frantically. 
Relaxing seems like the last thing you want to do. But taking a few moments out to relax your whole body and mind will make you much more efficient in the long run. I should mention one very important factor that influences our ability to relax, and that is peace of mind. It's very hard to relax your mind and body when our soul and our spirit are in turmoil. In one recent article on overcoming the power of stress, the author talked about practicing God's peace. Listen to what the prophet Isaiah promises. You will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you. The New Testament also speaks of spiritual peace as a gift which Christ bestows on his followers. We need to plug into that resource, that peace. Furthermore, the Apostle Paul shares something wonderful about God's peace in the book of Philippians. Listen to Paul's assurance. The peace of God which transcends human understanding will keep constant guard over your hearts and minds as they rest in Christ Jesus. The peace of God is more powerful than all the pressures and strains we face at work. It's an active quality that can keep guard over our hearts and minds. It keeps us from spinning down through that negative cycle of resentment, complaint, worry and helplessness. Having the peace of God is the foundation for really relaxing our minds and bodies. And the best way to get that peace is to start the day slowly with some quality time with God. The book Steps to Christ suggests this so beautifully. Each morning, consecrate yourself to God for that day. Surrender all your plans to Him to be carried out or given up as His providence shall indicate. When we do this every day, God can give us that peace which transcends human understanding. Now to our sixth strategy for preventing burnout. Help someone else cope with pressure. Any teacher will tell you that we learn best when we help someone else learn. Well, it's also true that we cope best when we help someone else cope. Research has demonstrated over and over that burned out individuals rarely share their feelings, even with their partner. They keep everything locked up inside, assuming that no one else could possibly understand their problems. We need to reach out to other people. Don't let the cycle of burnout isolate you. There are plenty of individuals who can relate to what you're going through and who need your sympathy and support too. Remember that a helping relationship involves listening carefully, showing respect for and trust in the other person. It may take some effort to get out of your own feelings and into someone else's, but the effort produces great rewards. The most important thing that you can do to avoid the road to burnout is to know where you're going and to know where you want to go. What's the biggest passion in your life? What's your ultimate goal? Do you seem to be losing the battle against burnout? Ask yourself whether you've really plugged in to God's resources. Let's make that essential connection right now as we pray. Father in heaven, a lot of us feel the strain of unrelieved stress at our jobs. A lot of us are wearing out and burning out. Please help us adopt strategies that will break the cycle. Help us to be able to reverse the process. We need to aim our lives in a healthy direction. Help us start by aiming our hearts in your direction. We need your peace and we need your power in our lives. We ask for this in the name of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. As our program comes to a close today, May I share with you one method I found personally helpful in dealing with the stress of my life. As you can imagine, I have a heart, lungs and stomach just like you do. And I found something enormously helpful. Often when I'm facing unusually incredible deadlines, it's necessary for me to get away from the office, even with the work pressing, to walk some of the trails of the Blue Mountains, to take a few deep breaths and to regain my perspective. And there's a question that I often ask myself, and it's this. 
What am I living for? And at the end of my life, as I look back over my life, what will bring me joy at the end? And sometimes out in those trails and those quiet mountain valleys, I sense again that the reason for life is to please God. The reason for life is to live for the creator of the universe. And I invite the one that made me, the one that created me, the one that fashioned me to relieve my tension, to relieve my anxiety, to give me that new sense of peace. For a generation of frayed nerves and unusually tight deadlines, in a generation where there is increased pressure, Jesus himself said, Come unto me, all you that labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I come to the one whose burden is light. I found that a satisfactory answer, and you can find it as an answer too. The rest that is found in Jesus. Until next week, remember, it is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God.